prophets. I hope you've enjoyed as we go through these. You've probably never heard sermons from these before. Uh, the book of Nahum. Now, actually, I had lunch with a pastor friend of mine today, and we're sitting there, and, and we're talking about what we were doing, what we're going over tonight. And I said, man, I've been doing the overview of the books of the Bible. And I said, tonight we're in the book of Nahum. He goes, Nahum? And I said, yeah. I said, I said, man, you need to know the book of Nahum. I said, what are you going to do when we get to heaven? And Nahum said, so how'd you like my book? <laughs> right? I said, you need to know these things, and you know what they're going to say, right? But Nahum, we are focused. It is a, another just short little book. Um, kind of like some of the other prophets that we've seen so far that we don't really know a whole lot about him, uh, about him personally. Uh, Nahum, uh, this book, as you see right here, is only three chapters long. It's not long at all. And if it has one theme, the theme is this, the judgment of Nineveh. That is it, the judgment of Nineveh. Now, let me explain this to you as well. <clears throat> if you remember Obadiah, only... Uh, only Nahum and Obadiah focused only on the prophecy of the destruction of certain pagan cities. Now, tri quick, uh, quick trivia. All right, here we go. What was the city that Obadiah prophesied against? Does anybody remember? Y'all, I know it was a month ago, and you probably don't remember that. But anybody? Edom. Edom. I don't know if y'all remember that or not, but Edom, once again, that, that's who Obadiah prophesied against. And tonight we're going to see Nahum actually speak against Assyria, but one city, the capital city of Assyria in general, Nineveh. Now, as soon as I said Nineveh, you probably thought, wait a minute, Nineveh? I thought they repented. I thought they repented when Jonah came to them, right? He went to them. And, and, and actually, let me just say this. It's probably a good idea to study Jonah and Nahum at the same time together, okay? Because it's kind of like Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story, okay? You read Jonah, and then you see what happened to him later on, okay? And it's the rest of the story. Um, but together, once again, it, it, there's actually about 100 to 150 years, scholars believe, that it is a difference between Nahum and Jonah, okay? So about 100 years, 100 to 150 years difference between the two uh, before Nahum actually appeared on the scene after Jonah went to Nineveh and gave that message from God. Uh, but now, like I said, we see the, the ending of what is happening to the Ninevites. And in time, basically, here's what it boiled down to. The revival wore off. Does it sound familiar? Revivals do. They wear off. They don't last forever. And that's what's happened right here. And in time, the Ninevites actually went right back into their paganism. They went right back into acting just like they did before. And in time, listen, they actually became even more brutal than they were before. Okay? And that's what they were known for. Now, most scholars believe that God did not actually send Nahum to Nineveh. Instead, he just sent the prophecy to Nineveh, okay? And I remind you, once again, he sent Jonah, but he didn't send Nahum. Now, that brings up the question, well, if God sent Jonah to Nineveh, why didn't he send Nahum to Nineveh? Why is that the case? Well, I want to remind you, friends, that God's methods vary, right? We know that they vary. We know that. But something to think about is that he sent Jonah to Nineveh because the Bible actually says that it was a great, wicked city. Remember that? It, is a great, it was a great, wicked city, but they were totally ignorant of God. I want to remind you of that. They were totally ignorant of God. When the message was brought, and I remind you, friends, that it was brought sarcastically. Do you remember that? He just did what God told him to do. Jonah went through town one time. Do you remember that? It actually said he, he went straight through town, and then he left and sat back and watched on the hillside, right? So once again, but just by preaching one time, God's going to destroy the city 40 days. Went through the town, said that, and what happened? Great revival broke out. And the Bible even says that from the king to the lowly servants, right, all of them worshipped God. And revival broke out in the land. And once again, that's what happened. But when the message was brought, the city turned to God. And God spared the city. But now listen to me. Here's what I'm getting at. It's 100 to 150 years later, possibly, as we said, and the city has relapsed, and it's returned back to its old ways. So probably the reason why God did not send Nahum like he did to Jonah is because they could have used the excuse before that, well, no one's told us. We've never heard about this God. Right? They could have used that excuse before God destroyed them the first time. But the issue, because we know Romans 10, 14 says this, 
How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So there had to be an original preacher sent to the Ninevites. And Jonah was that original preacher. Now, because they may not have forgotten God and passed along, listen, that wasn't Jonah's fault and it wasn't God's fault. It was their fault for not passing it along. It was their fault. So possibly that's why they didn't send, God didn't send Nahum like he sent Jonah. There had to actually be a preacher. There had to be a prophet to go to them. Once again, God in his mercy and his grace loved them to where he wanted them to hear. He wanted them to have the chance before he destroyed them, right? And by giving them that chance, we know they repented. But with Nahum, listen, it's a little bit of a different story here. Now, once again, there is no excuse. They had that light that they should have passed on, but they didn't. And they've rejected it. The revival didn't last like most revivals. And they actually departed from the living and true God. Now, Nahum is the author. Okay? There is no doubt about this. So, Nahum is the author. And the only thing we really know about him is the fact that he says right here in verse 1 that he is an Elkishite. Okay? Look at this right here. Look in verse 1. He says it's the burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. Okay? So, now listen. There's two possibilities as to where Nahum is from, okay? Let me explain to you. There was actually two cities at that time called Elkish. Elkish, okay? One of them is actually, there's a city called Elkish in Assyria, which is seven miles north of Nineveh. And people would say, well, that makes sense. You know, once again, for God to give him the message there, to since he's so close to Nineveh, that would make sense. But guess what? More than likely, that's not the one that he was from. He was actually, scholars believe, there's another city named Elkish, south of Galilee in Judah. And most scholars believe that that is where Nahum is from, in that land of Elkish, okay? So as you can see on your sheet, though, the time frame that it was written around 650 B.C., which once again puts him about 100 to 150 years after the prophet Jonah, that also means this. I always try to give you a perspective about what time frame it was. That he lived during the reign of King Hezekiah. The reign of King Hezekiah. That's when Nahum lived. And, and actually it is believed that he, during, since it's during this time period, that he actually saw the destruction of the northern kingdom. Okay, so he was alive during the destruction of the northern kingdom. But the main focus of this book is that he rings the death bell for Nineveh. That's the focus. That's the theme. He rings the death bell, and listen, there's nothing Nineveh can do about it. It's too late. Do you remember last week when we talked a little bit in the, in the book of, uh, what we looked at, I just went blank, what was the book last week? Micah, Micah yeah. We looked, at, we looked at Micah. When Micah, we talked about the fact, and I gave the illustration that Robert Jeffers talked about when he pushed the button. It was, the button was pushed, but it took a while before the pillars to start collapsing down. Well, guess what? The button's already been pushed here for the Ninevites. It's over, and it's about to come tumbling down, and God is using Nahum to speak to the people and saying, here's the judgment that's coming. It's too late for you. It's over, and we're actually going to see a little bit of that later on, okay? But the name Nahum means this. If you don't write this down, the comforter. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He's the comforter, and yet he's talking about judgment coming? What? I mean, and once again, we know their names had meaning back then, right? And once again, his name meant the comforter. Well, that's not very comforting, and that's not much comfort in this judgment. Well, listen, it's not for Nineveh, but it is for Judah. What do you mean? Well, this message brought comfort to them because of the suffering that they had faced because of Assyria and because of Nineveh. Like I said, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And so because of the judgment that they had been placed under and because of the attacks of the Assyrians... Now, finally, it's comfort for the, for the Jews. Because why? Because now their enemies is getting what's coming to them. Okay? It's finally about to happen. And so they can take comfort in that. <coughs> Excuse me. If you know that judgment is finally coming to your enemy, that might bring some comfort to you. Right? <laughs> and so maybe that is the case. But let's go ahead and let's dive in this short book here tonight. Okay? Let's look right at it. We, we begin by seeing, first of all, number one in your outline, that God brings comfort to Judah. And this is in chapter 1. God brings comfort to Judah. Now, Nahum gets right to the point 
And he tells us right here what his book is about by saying this, the burden against Nineveh. Now, let me explain to you. You see, burden, if you want to write this out to the side, means judgment. That's what the word actually means. The word burden there is judgment. And it's also used in the prophecy of Isaiah. The burden, the judgment, okay? Now, earlier on, Jonah brought a message to Nineveh, which revealed the love of God. But now the message of Nahum brings the justice of God. But church, can I remind you of something? God's love and his justice go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. They really do. Guess what? You discipline your children. Why? Because you love them. Right? That's the reason why. You don't discipline other people's kids. Why? Because you don't love them like your kids. <laughs> right? But the issue is this. He disciplines because he loves. They go hand in hand. And so he loves, but he disciplines whom he loves. We know that because of what the Bible tells us. But he loves, but he is just, and he must deal with sin. As a matter of fact, according to chapter 3, verse 19... Nineveh had actually, as I said, came to a place where he had to deal with their sin. There was no healing for them, and so discipline had to come. Matter of fact, flip over there. Look at it right fast. Chapter 3, verse 19. It says this. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you for upon you. Whom has not your wickedness passed continually? And that's how it ends with the question there. So in other words, once again, there is no healing for them. Once again, the judgment of God is about to come down upon them. We're going to see that. And he's like, mm, there's no recovery for you. There's no recovery whatsoever. And we're going to see that and we'll get to it in just a little bit. But Nahum actually meant, mentions the reason for this judgment. How far off have they gotten? Really, in 100 to 150 years, can a nation really move away that quickly? <laughs> Friends, think how quickly America has moved away. Think about the last 20 years. Think about the last 10 years. Think about the, the things that has turned away from God. Think about this. And, and think about, yes, they, they have turned away throughout this time. And, and so, ma matter of fact, like I said, in verse 2, it says the reason why, his reason for his judgment. Notice what it says. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. That's what it says. That God is a jealous God and the Lord avenges. Now, he's jealous. Why? Because they have turned their backs on him and started worshiping, once again, the pagan gods. Okay? So he's jealous of this, and he avenges those that have wronged his people. We know that all throughout Scripture. But now in verse 3 right here, listen, Nahum actually teaches us a great principle by which God not only judged the Ninevites, but actually I believe it's the way that God judges the entire world, and he will judge the world in the future. Listen to verse 3. It says this. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all equip the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Y'all, let's talk about this for a moment. Friends, we know that God will eventually judge the wicked. You know, I'll just say this right now. We're living in a time where we kind of look back and like, God, how much longer are they going to get away with this? Anybody else ever think that? Yeah? And maybe we sit back and we're like, God, God's got to do something here. You know what I mean? This is getting worse and worse by the day. Right? Well, we wonder that. Well, the reason why it says right there, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Let me just say this. Aren't you thankful that God is slow in anger? Yes. But not only that, but then notice this. And great in his power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way. In other words, he has his way of dealing with people. Keep going. In the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds with the dust of his feet. Let's talk about this right here. You see, listen, we know he will eventually judge the wicked. And while on this earth, listen, according to this passage, he may even use nature to do it. There's a lot of storms that are brewing up right now. And notice some of the areas and places that have been hit. I want you to think about some things. Hey, I, I will say this. I know some people may look at me as being, man, how could you say that? I remember thinking the first time New Orleans got nailed several years ago. Anybody ever been to New Orleans? Mm -hmm. Let me say this. I'm just saying it right now. 
It is wicked. It's evil. Brother Kyle, right before the cleanup, they had a, a decadence festival in New Orleans. Yes. Um, if you've ever been to New Orleans, and those of you that's been, when you pull into New Orleans, you can feel the spiritual oppression. I will say that. They have witchcraft on the streets. Everything. I mean, it, it's just open. I mean, they have, they, they, you pay right there on everything. I mean, it's out there in the open. They have that whole street. I just went blank. Bourbon Street, ain't that the name of it? That is, I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah. It is off, and they celebrate it out there in the midst of it. And so when it happened, I was like, God, maybe you're telling these people something. Maybe you're telling these people something. I mean, it is pure wickedness. If you've ever been there, you understand what I'm talking about. And, and so what I'm saying is this. According to this verse right here, he may even use nature to carry out his judgment upon countries. The storms are under his control. They serve a purpose. Think about that. They do. And not just the storms, but even all of the earth is at his command for judgment. Listen to verse 4 and 5. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Now listen, friends, verse 7 and 8 really brings comfort to those afflicted. Listen to what it says. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Hey, if you don't mind writing your Bibles, underline that verse right there. What a great passage. Then verse 8. But when an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. Now, what we see right here is he is reminding us, hey, I'm going to take care of my own. I'm going to take care of my own, but I will deal with the wicked. I'm going to deal with the wicked. Church, always remember something. Remember what he says right there at the beginning of verse 7. The Lord is good. Always remember that. Remember the Lord is good. But the greatest part that we always need to remember is that last part. It says this, and he knows those who trust him. What a great passage. He knows those that trust him. Y'all, he, he trusts in him. He is a personal God. He loves us individually. My friends, listen to me. God doesn't need a contact list to remember your name. He doesn't need it. No, no, no. Actually, he has your name written on his heart. He knows you, and he knows those that have trusted in him. But starting in verse 8, starting in verse 8, going through the rest of the chapter, God really proclaims vengeance upon this group of people. Listen to verse 14. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be per uh, perpetuated no longer out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave for you are vile. So we see right here that they've gone back to their images. They've gone back to their pagan gods. But listen at that in there. I will dig your grave for you are vile. Um, so far, every week, I've asked you the question of the prophets. Does this sound familiar? Here's a nation that's been blessed by God. They trusted God. They loved God. God gave them a chance to repent. They repented. Great revival took place in the land. And now instead they trust in their own power. They trust in, they put things ahead of him. They've made other gods ahead of him. Friends, I want to remind you, we don't have to make little carved images to have gods. They put their gods ahead of him, and now God calls them vile. Vile. Does this sound familiar? Absolutely. Church, we see this right here, but the final verse of this chapter is really hope for Judah. Listen to what he says in verse 15. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feast. Perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. In other words, here's what God is saying. He will try this because Judah has been under the oppression of the Assyrians. He comes in and he says this, Judah, you do what I've commanded you. You don't worry about 
them coming in. You don't worry about them coming in, upsetting your, 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 your feast and everything that I've told you to do. No, no, no. Don't you worry about them. You do what I have commanded you to do. Don't worry about your enemies. Listen, Judah, I will take care of them. You just be faithful to me. That's what he's saying right there. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feast. Perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. In other words, I'm going to take care of them, Judah. You just do what I've commanded you to do. You be faithful to me. I'm going to take care of those. And then, listen, he gets into this next point right here. Number two, which is our last point, because it's only three chapters long. Details of the destruction of Nineveh in chapters two and three. Y'all, listen, in these chapters right here, we see the justice, but not only that, but we also see the goodness of God exhibited in the execution of his decision to fully destroy Nineveh. It's coming right here. Now, the thing is this. God doesn't just talk about destroying Nineveh before he did that. Remember, he gave him a warning. You've got 40 days. If not, destruction's coming. He talked about it. Now, listen, the talking is over, and he's doing it. And that's what he's letting them know. Before, I gave you a warning. Now, it's just coming. It's coming right now. The thing is, God is going to destroy. Now, in chapter 2 right here, he actually prophesizes a frightful... I'm losing battery. I did. I'm out. Can you all still hear me? Yeah. All right. So, right here in chapter 2, he actually produces a frightful judgment to the people. And he's letting them know uh, that something is going to come, and he actually gives a literal fulfillment. He tells them exactly to a detail what is going to happen to them when the Medes are going to come in. Okay? Now, back in chapter 1, verse 14, God basically said this I'm going to bury you. That's what he said, right? Notice what he said back there I will dig your grave, I'm going to bury you. It's coming. Well, guess what? Now he lets them know that their devastation is going to be so great that nothing can stop it. But in the meantime, in verse 2, he says that Judah is going to be restored. Look right here. Verse 1 says, He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort. Watch the road. Strengthen your flanks. Fortify your power mightily. In other words, he's saying, he's telling them about, Get all your people together. Strengthen your military. Do everything that you think is going to make you okay. But then he says, but Judah, look at what he says in verse 2. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. In other words, kids, watch and see what I'm about to do. Watch and learn. See what I'm about to do right here, okay? Now, once again, that's what we see right here. So Judah is going to be restored. Now, this chapter is actually Nahum's detailed prophecy, which today is an accurate historical record of what took place 100 years after Nahum prophesied this. If y'all want to write that down in your Bibles or on your sheets, judgment to the exact detail of some things we're going to see, and I'm going to bring them out here in just a moment, took place 100 years. Now listen, people today may be saying, oh, y'all been saying that, that you know, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. Listen, the, low is not, the Lord is not slow concerning His promise. We know that. It's His timetable. But right here, it took 100 years to fulfill Nahum's prophecy, but it was fulfilled, okay? Assyria was well manned. They had the defense. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No, no, no. The destruction of Nineveh came about when the Medes actually came against the city. Now, what is interesting is look at the detail of this in verse 6 through 8. Look at this right here. It says this. The gates of the rivers are opened, and the palace is dissolved. It is decreed, so shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up. And her maidservant shall lead her as with the voice of doves, beating their breast. Let's talk about this. What in the world? Actually, go ahead and in verse 8. Though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry. 
but no one turns back. Let's talk about this for a moment. How, what in the world are you talking about, Brother Colin, the, the detail of this? Historians say that when the Medes attacked them, the only way, because they had a great defense of, of a wall, once again, that was the majority of cities' defense back in that time was walls, okay? Guess what happened? How were they able to penetrate Nineveh's wall? A flood happened. And it knocked out the entire east side of the wall of Nineveh. Well, guess what happened? The Medes were waiting for it to happen. And as soon as the flood happened, they came in and were able to go through that knockdown section of the wall where the flood had happened of the Tigris River. Okay? So we know that they went in. Historians tell us that's what happened. So knowing that that is the case, that that is what happened, read it again. Look at what it says. The gates of the rivers are opened, and the palace is dissolved. It is decreed, she shall be led away captive, she shall be brought up, and her maidservant shall lead her as with the voice of doves, beating their breast. Though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. What happened was this. The entire city was flooded. It was like a pool of water, as he, as he said, a hundred years before it happened, by the way. A hundred years, okay? It happened, the people went in, and the people just started, they left everything, and they were scattering, running away as the Medes were taking over and killing everyone. And the Medes were screaming for them to stop. And, of course, like normal people, we wouldn't stop, right? But they were screaming for them to halt, halt, and they wouldn't stop. But everyone that stopped was murdered. They were murdered. They were killed. So in other words, the word was fulfilled perfectly, just like Nahum said it was going to be, that the reason why they were able to be destroyed was because of the water, the river that was flooded over and knocked down part of the wall, and it flooded the city. And the Medes saw their opportunity. They went in and they took it. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened right there. The Medes came in. They took all of their gold. They took all of their silver. They took all their goods. How do you know, Brother Colin? Look at verse 9. Now I remind you, once again, it's 100 years previous. But listen, take spoil of silver. Take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The, the heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side. And all their faces are drained of color. In other words, they, they, these are the people that, once again, they've taken everything from them. And their faces are drained of color. They know what's coming. They know what's about to happen to them. Now, what's so incredible in, is the detail that's actually found in verse 11. Listen to this. Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion walked, the lioness and lion's cub, and no one made them afraid? Question mark. Brother Colin, what's the big deal? Why are you saying this is such great detail? <coughs> Well, you may, may think, was well, it just being like the lions have ran away that was in the area? Nope. Get this, y'all. The symbol for the country of Assyria was a lion. So in other words, God is mocking them right here. And he is saying, once again, where's the dwelling of the lions? You're big bad lions, right? Taking over other countries, doing everything else. Right? Keep going. And the feeding place of the young lions. Right? Where, where you're growing up children to be lions. Where the lions walk. The lioness and the lion's cub. And no one made them afraid? Question mark. God's mocking them. He's coming in. He's like, this is supposed to be a city of lions. That was your, that was your mascot. Where are they? They're destroyed. That's what God's saying there. They're destroyed. And he's getting at it right here. And so Assyria, like I said, they, they use that symbol as a line of its empire. And God's saying to Nahum, where are those that's supposed to be so mighty? Where are they? Next to me, they're nothing. That's what he's saying. That's what God's saying to him. Next to me, they're nothing. And then in verse 13, y'all, God drops the hammer. Listen to verse 13. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messenger shall be heard no more. In other words, I'm going to 
utterly annihilate you. I'm even going to, what is he saying? He's going to kill their children. That's what God is saying. What? A God of love. A just God. I remind you that even passed it on to their children. They were training up their children in the ways of paganism. They were training up their children in that way. They had already become the young lions, right? And so God takes them all out, and he drops the hammer. Now in chapter 3, I want you to listen to the detail of what happens to the city. And you're like, oh my goodness, but it's, it's detail. Listen. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. That's those of the Medes, by the way, that's coming in on judgment at this time. Horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. Because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries, behold, I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid to waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? What a description. He is saying, listen, you will be a shame to the world. You that once were such a powerful nation, I'm going to show the world your shame. The whole world is going to be against you, Nineveh, even to the point to where no one is going to come for you. No friends. And he says right here, the number of the dead people is going to be unbelievable. He said they're going to be tripping over corpses in the street. Wow. He, he calls it a bloody city in verse 1. Woe to the bloody city. He's telling them who they really are. And, and like I said, they were a nation that was against everyone else. So at this point in time, God's letting them know, hey, no one's going to come to your aid. No one's going to come to your side. And in verse 7, once again, God basically says, where in the world am I even going to get people to come and mourn you? No one is. No one's going to do it. Nobody's going to mourn over you. Listen to this description in verse 10. Yet she was carried away. She went into captivity her young children also were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. They cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. You know, before, you know, save the women and children. Now, the women and children will be put to death. And it says that their heads will be bashed at the end of the streets. Wow, God. That's what he says is going to happen. And the men are going to be carried away in chains to serve in the Medes army is basically what it's saying. They will be their servants. That's what's going to take place right here. Then here's what they try to do. Those that got away, basically they try to drink their problems away. Listen to verse 11. You also will be drunk. You will be hidden so that they've gone out. You also will seek refuge from the enemy. They try to drink their problems away, but guess what, friends? That never works. And it didn't work for them. They try to do this, and they try to hide, and it didn't work for them. But from verses 14 through the end of the book, Nahum actually tells them that they can try all they want. Matter of fact, he even tells them they can even make, try to make more bricks. They can try to build back the city with the little bit they have. And they can increase their population. They can increase their military. You can do all this before the Medes come for you, but it's not going to matter. Listen to what he says right there. Start with verse 14. Draw your water for the siege. In other words, what they would do, let me explain this to you. They would draw water, and they would boil the water. And as people would come upon the wall, the siege the wall, they would pour the boiling water upon them. That's what they're talking about, draw the water for the siege, okay? So that was a part of defense. God's saying, hey, go ahead and draw all the water you want. Draw all the water, then keep going. Look what he says. Fortify your strongholds. Go into, go into the clay and tread the mortar. In other words, make brick. Make strong the brick kiln. 
There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will eat you up like a locust. Make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locust. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. Your commanders are like swarming locusts, and your generals like great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges on a cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away, and the place where they are is not known. In other words, he's saying this. Build your army up. Get your commanders together. Let them be as number as, as many as the locusts if you want to. Guess what? It's not going to matter. I'm God. Yo, know, that's, that's something to remember. No matter how powerful and mighty we may think we are, he's God. Verse 18 and 19 says this, Your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains and no one gathers them. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? Friends, when we see this right here, it, it's, it's heart, heartbreaking. It really is. But basically, Nahum tells them, you can try all you want, but guess what? It's not going to matter. Nothing is going to stop God's judgment. And friends, history tells us that it didn't. It came just as he said it would. So friends, that's how this book ends. So let's answer the question we do every week. Brother Colin, how in the world does this book apply to us? Matter of fact, you, you may be thinking the prophecy has already been fulfilled. So, so how can this book be meaningful to us? Well, friends, I want to remind you the remarkable thing about the Word of God is that no matter where we turn in this book, there is a message for us. In every book, some of the messages may be directed to us, but I want to remind you that all of the messages are for us. All of them are for us. And Nineveh, friends, is a great reminder for us. We, along with Nineveh, we, friends, have been a great nation. We've had a great revival in our country. We've had different things, but listen, not so much anymore. In his commentary, J. Vernon McGee brings out an interesting point. Listen to what he said. He said this. The average life of great civilizations of the world has been about 200 years. And they have progressed through these following stages. Listen to these stages that he says right here. From bondage to spiritual faith. From spiritual faith to courage. From courage to liberty. From liberty to abundance. From abundance to selfishness. From selfishness to complacency. From complacency to apathy. From apathy back to bondage. Friends, when I read that, it's interesting to me because America is now over 200 years old. And I want you to think about this. Think about those stages that I just read to you. And I want you to think about what stage we're in. The last one. I believe. Think about the last two. From complacency to apathy, then from apathy back to bondage. This is the message that was given to Nineveh from Nahum. And this is the message that I believe the Lord has given us. Friends, God is going to judge us. I believe that is the case, and I believe that just like he judged the Ninevites, he's going to judge us. So let's do what we need to do in the time that we have allotted to do all we can for the kingdom of God. Let's do all we can. Church, Nahum teaches us that God is holy and righteous and God still moves in the lives of nations today. He's active. He isn't just sitting back saying, ah, oh, do what you want to do. No, it's all in his time. And I believe the button's been pushed. The warning's been given. Now, maybe things are falling over and things are falling into place. May God forgive us. 
but may we be the church that he's called us to be. And I'm not talking about Central Baptist Church. I'm talking about the church. May we be the church that is found faithful when he comes for his bride. Key verse. Memory verse. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. It's short. I should, I'm expecting a lot of names next week. Nahum 1 7 says this. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. Questions or comments? Let me hear it, Mr. Marty. Just that, that what you just said, though, uh, what the senator said about <coughs> the steps. So we could be going in from apathy to uh, bondage. Yes, sir. Absolutely. It's a scary situation. It is. It really is. Because if you think about it, America has definitely, let's think about it, it's gone from bondage to spiritual faith, right? Then from spiritual faith to courage, right? From courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy back to bondage. Every country has, that's what he said, he said every nation has lasted around 200 years and have gone through that phase. We have as well. Yes, sir. He goes on to mention about Nahum is quite thrilling to him because he reveals the other side of God's tributes. He said God is a God of love, but he's also a God of holiness, righteousness, and goodness. Yes, sir. And so we have to see God as he's totally God, not just part of it. We like to see the love part, but we don't like to see those other parts sometimes. So. Yes, sir. But that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. And I got a, a little uh, mission here from Nahum. It's uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 6 from your friend. Charles Spurgeon, and he said, uh, his love does not diminish his justice, nor does his justice in the least degree. And he says, either he will either have satisfaction from you or else from Christ. And there's something like that. And then he says, uh, he will sooner lose his Godhead than suffer one sin to go unpunished or one art of partial rebellion unrevenged. And then the last thing I've got here in chapter 1, verse 7 says, It was God's goodness that provided Christ Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, and that is our stronghold in the day of trouble. It says, Through trust in Him, wicked men are not merely acquitted, but are justified and made righteous before God. So we never were acquitted. We were made we're righteous. righteous. Yes, sir. Absolutely. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Other questions? Comments? No, no, no. He, he prophesied that they were coming. He didn't tell them who, and he doesn't mention this right here, but history tells us that 100 years, that this was fulfilled to the detail as far as with the river uh, going over, that it, the city would be like a, like a um, you know, a, a small pond, you know, type deal and all this different stuff. That's exactly what happened when the Medes came in. So ultimately, Nahum is prophesying about what was going to happen. God was telling them, hey, you've gone too far. Here's what's going to happen to you. No, ma'am, he didn't. It's just history. History has told us that, that it was the meat. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Good. And this people group is no more? No, sir. They are no more. That's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. He did what he said he was going to do. He was going to bury them. And, and once again, he, and that he did, and annihilate them. And that he did. He wiped them off the map. So Ninev the Ninevites, once again, he gave them that warning through Jonah, they had that revival within 100 to 150 years later, Nahum came along. And once again, they had gone right back even worse than before because they knew better and they should have passed it along among the people, but they didn't. What about the people that went through the revival? They were already dead and gone. They're good though, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The Ninevites were, yes. The ones that were saved. The whole city was. The whole city went through revival. But just like us, I mean, think about, think about what could happen within 100 years. What has happened within 100 years, you know? I mean, think about the great revivals of Billy Graham, even. You know, I mean, think about all that. Um, a lot of the people don't remember those anymore. You know, a lot of, some of the older ones do, and maybe some of the younger ones, you know? The only way that you'll hear about Billy Graham now is <coughs> like, uh, and I've told it before, when I was growing up as a teenager, when Billy Graham <laughs> came on Channel 6, Paducah, Kentucky, I did not watch. 
I don't know why. I just didn't care nothing about listening to Billy Graham. But after I got older and older, of course I'm going, and uh, you know, they'd show a classic of Billy Graham on TV. I'd watch it from the time it started to the time it ends. That a boy, Ray. <laughs> you didn't say right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else tonight? It's about Nathan. I thought you had a question. <laughs> no? It's a good little book. Now you can tell Nahum, I liked your book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that was that was that was a great great lesson. All right, let's go to the Lord in time of prayer.